our dynamic has always been the same and it still is. I'm his dad. I'm not his manager. I'm not his homeboy. I'm his dad. I call him Spank, but Destroy Lonely. Um, he has always liked rap, but he wasn't interested in becoming a rapper. He thought it was cool that I did it, but he was very fascinated with science. Okay, but, and this is something you told me about it and pardon me if this is too personal, but one thing you told me you did when you started making money was that you set up trust for your kid's college. Yeah. And so I believe they, well, they your oldest it. son went to college and your young, well, we'll get into your youngest son because you're wearing his t-shirt or his hoodie. They were moving in two very academic directions and granted, even from you, you were what, you were a psych major when you I was. Tell, tell me kind of about the academic paths that, that your kids took, given that you had this kind of academic versus musical conflict. I think I ruined, I, I think I ruined them, but I don't regret the ruin. I, I hope that answer makes sense. I was in school. I was doing well in school, but I wasn't happy. And uh, I, I knew I wanted to do music. I knew music was my thing. I knew I was interested in doing music. So I left, I left school um, and came home to try to do music and ended up getting involved in a lot of other things that didn't have nothing to do with music, but I knew I wanted to do music. So when my kids were coming, I started putting money to the side for them because my mentality was, you're not going to go the path of music. You're going to go the traditional path. And it's going to be that I'm going to, I guess, justify me leaving school by being able to take this money and show that I put them on a better path. The problem that I think that I completely underestimated is when your kids are in a house with you and you're rapping and they're going with you to concerts and they're going with you to shows. And sometimes they're going with you on tour and MTV they're not going to go, this is cool, but I really want to go to four years of college. You know, that, that, <laughs> that was, that, that ended up being the last thing on their mind. Um, and they ended up catching that rap bug. So what's crazy to me is I, I, this blew my mind. I was confused because you had, you have two sons um, and, and you have other kids, but they're younger. Your, your oldest son was rapping your youngest son that's the kid that becomes destroyed lonely mm -hmm. when when did he get into music i didn't know i i this is blowing my mind because i remember hearing all about him and i think i even slept in remember his, I even showed you some of those i sent you some clips of when he was at science fairs remember yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. he um I guess I'll tell the story like this. The, as you know, the oldest son, his name is Cameron. My oldest son's name is Cameron. He's always rapped. Now, one thing that, 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 I, that is not true, I call him Spank, but Destroy Lonely, um, he has always liked rap, but he didn't see it as like what he was going to do. We, they grew up in a rap house. Nobody does not like rap in my house. And the way that I grew up in a house where my parents were playing the OJs or what have you. I'm playing Ice Cube and Scarface or whatever. So there is now no room to not like rap in my house. Um, but he wasn't interested in becoming a rapper. He thought it was cool that I did it, but he was very fascinated with science. He had always been fascinated with science. Um, ever since the Georgia, Georgia Aquarium came to Atlanta, he, he was constantly there, constantly into engineering, always really good at math. He began taking things apart from the time he was maybe eight years old, reassembling them just to see how they worked. Um, that's crazy to remember the story that at one point in time when he was a kid for summer, he learned to reprogram Xbox controllers to work on PlayStations. And that was like something that he was doing for kids or when a kid's controller would stop working, he figured out how to reprogram. He was really into that. He did science fairs, all type of things. Always just listen to rap, but would honestly be very uh, self-aware that he was like, that's not my thing. Now, here's the part that I have to be honest about and where I might have corrupted him. Uh, I used to make my kids play a game called the rhyme game. The rhyme game is when they're in the car with me, if we came to a stop sign or a traffic light or anything that impeded our progress, I said a word and they had to think of as many words as they could that rhymed with that word. So if I stopped and I was like, pop, they had to be like, top, stop, drop, flop. And I did that so they could be better at freestyling. 
Then I finally put a studio in my house. I put a studio in my house and my oldest son would have fun recording. But then every now and again, my youngest son would be like, I want to say something. And he'd say something. He was only nine when I first put the studio in the house. So he would just kind of come in and laugh on something or joke. But when he was nine years old, he wrote a whole four bar verse, which for me was incredibly advanced at nine. But again, he said he didn't really care nothing about rapping. So I didn't think anything of it. I thought he was just having fun with me and his brother. In his defense, this didn't come out of anywhere because by the time he was 12 and 13, he'd write verses for fun. And just be like, I wrote a verse for fun. You want to hear it? And I'd be like, yeah. But it was his brother who was trying to get studio time and going with me to video shoots or wherever the case may be. But I guess maybe about 15, he had a rap name. And if you're a rapper, once you get a rap name, you know it's, it's over. When Tommy was 15, he had a rap name. And I was like, oh, he might be gone. <laughs> it, it wasn't Destroy Lonely back then, was it? His first rap name was AU. And the reason why his first rap name was AU because that is gold on the periodic yep. table. <laughs> so his <laughs> so that shows you where he was <laughs> at that time. He um I made I, I had all of them say, uh, tell me at first I had them listen to the rap I like, then I was like, you gotta determine who your favorite rapper is and what you like. And his first favorite rapper was Scarface. But shortly after Scarface, he got really into MF Doom. And I was like, oh, he's going to be, you know, more in that vein kind of rap. So his first few years was all about Joey Badass, MF Doom. Um, he had gone back and found some hieroglyphics. He was into that type of stuff. Because, you know, stylistically and aesthetically speaking, people might listen to his music now and think now nah, that mf doom influence you know his father's influence and given that i know you it feels like the kind of like pop rock aesthetic makes perfect sense so as you know i'm really into heavy metal punk rock music so when he really found his voice of what he liked was not his nails you know that was some of the first things that he really liked um Port his head, um, you know, just those type of things. I saw oh, he has good taste. Wow. So those are the things he really started to grab. But, you know, I listen to everything. So they were listening to everything. And I feel like that's a very Atlanta thing to do. Like I, my entrance into the, into the music industry was touring on Warp Tour and working in rock music. So I feel like Atlanta is such, especially on the East side, it's such an eclectic vibe of sounds. A lot of us grew up playing in bands or being around people in bands. It's like, yeah, Atlanta has an ear for eclecticism. So it to me, it makes a ton of sense. To me too. To me too. And and as Payne knows, I've always been into all types of music, but I started to see him kind of gravitate towards that. So I think to kind of answer your question, Payne, I think when he found out that he could do rap the way he wanted to, is when it really became appealing to him. I think maybe before he thought he would have to do rap the way I did it, or how Chris did it, you know, or any of the people that he was growing up around. I think once he kind of realized I can kind of do it the way I want to do it, it became much more appealing to him. Yeah, because that's that's what you were telling me off camera, that he just kind of struggled with the image and the content that he thought the fans would want. And he is the rapper for the youth. If you are of the current generation of youth, Destroy Lonely is your guy, period. From it, I think it came from the fact that he's him. He was always very honest that he's like, I can't say a whole bunch of shit that has nothing to do with how my childhood was. I think that we always underestimate that, that every person is looking for someone who's a voice for them. I think, I think in hip hop, we get obsessed with the idea that if it's rap, this is the message. Versus that there's large groups of people that they're looking for an artist. Hell, me and you talked about not to sidebar, but why it, it it was a crazy story for me because you brought it to my attention. I vividly remember being on being on a road with Luda on a huge tour, and the tour stopped in Kansas City. 
and me and DJ JC were like, we want to go see Tech Nine. And Tech Nine was, I was fascinated by Tech Nine because he was this artist at a time where you needed a million dollar video, you know, uh, millions of dollars worth of production. And he was thriving in like his own independent circle. So I was fascinated. We go to the show, see the show, and it was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life, right? And I just remember, how the hell is he doing this? Because at that time, my mom was like, you got to have a major label behind you. You got to have this. You got to do that. His show was completely packed. Everybody is faces painted. It's insane. He has an incredible live performance. So much so that the following year, maybe like a year or two later, we're at a BET Summer Jam Spring Fest something. I take my time to go down there and I go speak to him and I just shake his hand and I'm like, man, I came to one of your shows or whatever. He ends up putting that in a song, this song called Why You Ain't Call Me, <laughs> um, about the fact that I came and spoke to him, you know, and just shook his hand. I didn't know that for him, he was kind of like more rappers should be seeing me and being like, I want to do what he does. And I didn't I didn't know that that's something that he was looking at it like. I'm saying all that to say, I think that's how my son felt when he started to do music, you know, it. it what happens if you do know your dad <laughs> and your dad is in your life and and you didn't grow up in maybe this harsh condition or whatever the case may be, but you still do this music? Is there an audience or a group of people that want to hear that? Yeah. And, and there, well, the answer is yes. I know it's a rhetorical question, but very clearly there's this groundswell really? of support. <laughs> yeah. So when when did things really take off for him that you noticed, you know, like. I know he was obviously performing and taking things seriously before the Playboy Cardi um, situation, but in a nutshell, how did how did that timeline look? I thought he was doing well with his SoundCloud. I don't even know if he still has a SoundCloud, but when I started to see how many people were on his SoundCloud, that was when I was like, okay, he, he's really making some noise. And then, as you know, because you and I are experienced, when he started doing shows, I don't think people realized that there's you have a level you, you can get streams, you can get people to look at you. But if somebody's willing to pay money yep. to see you, you are doing well. So his first shows, obviously, it wasn't like it was a huge crowd. But that's when I was like, you're doing well because people are willing to come and see you and see you perform. So I would say long before Cardi. His SoundCloud and when he started doing like shows on the east side here in Atlanta and started going various places around Atlanta and was doing shows. That was when I, I was like, in my mind, you made it. Everything after this is the cherry on top. Because again, it's not easy to get people to come see you perform live. Did he um, allow you to be involved in his career as he was getting started? I know there's like two sides of that. It's either like, I got to get it out the mud. I don't want my parent to help me. And then some kids are like, yo, I do want some guidance because my parent has been there before. Like, what was y'all's relationship dynamic like, especially as he started making money and making a name for himself? Our dynamic has always been the same and it still is. I'm his dad. I'm not his manager. I'm not his homeboy. I'm his dad. And so it's important to me that he got it out the mud, which he did. All of this is just him. I don't have nothing to do with his success in any way because I didn't fit. My job is to be his dad. And I did not want the lines to be blurred being the momager when he's my kid, you know? So when he was doing music, the only thing that I've ever provided and still provide to this day is he might call me and be like, hey, they're saying this, this, and that about a venue, what you think. Nah, that don't sound right, or whatever the case may be. So our conversations are mostly be mindful of this, think about this, that's good, that doesn't sound as good. But in terms of being involved, both of us, that's not what we want, because I always want to be his dad. It's, it's always more important to me to be his dad and for me and his mother and his family to be something that's separate from an industry that I loathe and that while I'm proud of him, I hate the music industry. Yeah. Did you, did you impart a lot of wisdom on, on, onto him based on some of your, I guess, negative and positive experiences in the music business when you first started seeing that, okay, he's kind of 
a, a mirror image of you in the sense that he was on an academic path and then he just pivoted and took music, you know, to be his calling. And suddenly, you know, there's, he's, he's doing it independently. Suddenly he works with another rapper and, and everything just explodes from there. It's very similar to your journey now that I say it out loud. I only give advice where he asks. I have a good dad. You have a good dad. Good dads check in when you ask them to, but they aren't overbearing. They're always present, but they're not trying to run your life. You know that as well as anyone because you got a good dad. And um, so I am always available, but I didn't want to taint him. I don't, I don't, I try not to tell anybody the music industry is good or bad because that's my experience. It could be somebody who's like, I was in the music industry 50 years and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. So I definitely didn't want him to have a, a, a sour perspective on the industry. I don't, it isn't the music industry I hate. It's that I think anytime you have something pure, everybody on this call is a creative. Once you start getting suits and something creative, I don't think those worlds are meant to mix. I want to go back to something that Payne pointed out that I feel like a lot of artists from your era missed out on. And I hear it because I kind of work on both sides. I'm an executive, but I am way more on the creative side, which is why I was like, I have to get out of the business shit because it's so convoluted. And it's like, yeah, but... You, uh, Payne said you set up trust for your kids. I know, again, growing up here in Atlanta and uh, kind of going back and forth between Nashville as well. My mom was a little bit in the industry on the management side too when I was younger, but so many people thought the money was never going to run out. So they just never set anything up. So it's like, when you hear them talk, even they're just so bitter about their experience and and not to say, because I think that especially a lot of black creatives were taken completely advantage of. I'm sure you have plenty of stories of that money that was owed to you, finding out that your percentages were way lower. But I do hear you saying basically you took your moment and you didn't just let it last for a moment. You set yourself up. Was that something that you just knew or you taught yourself? Was that influence from somebody else in the industry? Or was that just you had a, a legacy building mindset? Like, where did that come from? Man, all, what a great question. All of that. I don't know if that's a fair answer. All of that. Again, I know this seems like I'm beating a dead point, but I have really good parents. I have really good parents who communicate with me, who are very involved in my life. I have sisters who I'm very close with. Um being a child of immigrants, there's a whole community of us that are very close. So the idea of me and my dad being close and my dad, me growing up knowing my dad's whole thing was like, if I die and my kids are straight, I lived a good life was the instruction I've always been seen and told since I was young. That's the man I grew up with was a man whose mentality was, if y'all are good, I've done good. If y'all are fine, I've done well. And so for me, I think I would love to say, oh, it was in my mind, but it was my influence. That was my influence. And when my kids came into the world, I wanted to do the same thing my dad had always done for me. My dad came to this country with nothing, worked for years, but then got his own business going and got it out the mud and, you know, did it for himself. And he wanted to make sure my sisters and I were good. I wanted to make sure my kids were good. But that being said, I don't know if everyone, and, and I'm speaking to your point, not speaking in contradiction to your point. I think sometimes what, what manifests as bitterness is the, the idea that the martyr rarely reaps the benefit. It took a lot of us getting screwed over for screaming to be better, for there to be more ways to get paid. Part of my friendship with Payne is that he's a super educated producer who knows the ins and outs of how to get paid. So Payne's videos are going to make sure a new generation of producers are going to get their money. Um, but there's a whole generation of producers before Payne who didn't get their money. They're not mad at the new generation. They're like, we were trying to fight for this back when there wasn't a collective thought that this was owed to us, that we should have this, that there were a lot of other artists who felt like, Shh, just be quiet, just take what you can. It's difficult to be the vocal one early on. Um, and so a lot of the artists, I think that uh, 
I know they sound better, uh, but a lot of their frustration is not with the younger generation. It's with the idea that they feel like, damn, these were things that I was asking for early on. These were things that I saw early on. Are the early record deals, man, there's more ways to get paid now. There's more ways to make generational wealth now. There's an easier path to generational wealth now. I don't know if everybody's resentful. They probably are between you and I. <laughs> but I also, I think that sometimes it's difficult if you're if you're the martyr and you lived through the martyrdom to know you won't benefit from your sacrifice. Yeah, no, I get it. I'm not saying bitter as in that. Like, it's I didn't negative. Mean it like that, I, apologize. I didn't mean to make it seem like I was attacking your answer. I apologize. Yeah, no, no. And I get why they are, because especially, again, Black creatives, like my company represents creators so that we can exploit their IP to the highest degree. Because when I came into the music industry, I was like, this is slavery. We're making up the biggest genres, but we have the least market share. So yeah, I get why the previous generations, I just feel like when I came into the industry 12 years ago, almost 13 years now, nobody, again, back to Black people, that's my focal point, was teaching us, like, this is the brass tax of the business. So I really had to learn and get in and figure out how as an independent awesome. manager, you know, and so then when I started talking to a lot of people, they're like, man, don't do this. You're not going to make no money. There's no money here. They're going to screw you over. Man, I did all this and I'm broke now. I have to work for the man. So like, when I say bitter, it's justified because- No, no, no. Yeah, I completely agree. Sure. To answer your question, and I apologize. And you are completely right. Also, Luda. Luda did a really good job. Luda had opened me and 2 Chainz first bank account. That's another crazy story. He came to my house after the first album. And we were on the road. And he came to my house for us to go out. He's told this story before, so I know he won't mind me telling it. And I was like, let me get some money and went in the shoe closet. And I had a bunch of money in Nike boxes. <laughs> I'm an old dope boy. That's, you know, in my mind, you know, and he was just like, is that your money? Like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> he took me to the Bank of America. It's still on Keller Road. He took me to the Bank of America on Keller Road and helped me open a bank account. A couple of years later, showed me to open a business account. Um, so Luda was also really instrumental in the idea of take this money and put it there. Put this money here. You can blow this money, but don't touch that money or whatever the case may be. And he had gotten that. Used to be a book called Everything You Need to Know About the Music Industry. I don't even know if that's still a book. Donald Passman, <laughs> yeah, he still yeah. He puts out yeah, they just put a new every year. Yeah, I think the last edition was 2022. Yeah. He had us read it. He had us read it. He had us read it and kind of learn the ins and outs, man. So uh, Shaka had been a manager before. So I, I, I was fortunate enough to have people in the inner circle that all of us wasn't coming in green, just some of us. That's great. That's amazing. So bringing it back to your son, did you have that book around your house? I know you're not forcing any, any wisdom onto them, but obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, I don't know. I'm assuming there's a lot of opportunity, financial and otherwise coming at Destroy Lonely right now. And I would imagine he would probably defer to you on certain topics and, and experiences just because you've, you've gone through it, you know, I, and, and because financial literacy is a family tradition for you. How is that playing out given the fast paced success that he's experiencing at this point when he asks for help i'm present but i don't step in any other time he's a young man he has to live his own life the best thing that you can know for destroy lonely is he got to see my mistakes up close and personal so he doesn't have to hear a horror story he's able to be able to see firsthand decisions that i made he's able to see firsthand why you don't buy a bunch of cars, you know, <laughs> yeah, he was able to see some of those things firsthand and he's a smart kid. He's a really, really, really smart kid. So, um, I feel very, very fortunate from where I'm seeing he is with his financial decisions from where I was when I was 22 years old. 
I'm sorry. I'm smirking because I, I just <laughs> I'm hearing previous conversations we've had where you used to tell me, you know, when he was a, a young teenager and you'd say, my son just figured out this. My son just won this prize in, in the science fair. I was like, wow, how did he figure that out? Because personally, I never had, especially at that age, and I was I had like a 1.8 GPA and a juvenile criminal record. Like I wasn't deconstructing and reverse engineering bits of machinery and, and computer components. And I was like, how do you figure that out? And I remember you took a pause and you looked at me and you're like, Payne, contrary to what you may believe, I'm actually pretty intelligent so I can make smart kids. <laughs> I think that I just feel like there's a stigmatism about rappers that if you're rapping, you're dumb, that we didn't live lives prior to being involved in music. And I, for me, it was just like, it almost felt like you were like, but you are so dumb. Why would your kids be smart? I can't seem to put my finger on why you have smart kids when you're really dumb. <laughs> I'm, um, this whole time. No, that's not what I meant. I, I'm um, impressed at what your kid was doing. Cause I'm thinking back on my experience at that age, but no, I know like, I, I can't have conversations with that because I'm a nerd. I don't, I don't know when that happened. That happened in adulthood. That happened way after. Like, No, it did rep- not. School is not a representation of your intelligence. It is not. It is not a representation of your intelligence. You can be completely disinterested in school and be an amazingly intelligent person. School is not reflective of intellect. It's a reflection of investment. Those are two completely different things. So I don't think you should sell yourself short that you may have not been particularly interested in the curriculum that your school was providing to be a testament to your intellect. I had my kids, when I would talk to you about them, I did something very different than my parents did. I encouraged them to explore. I encouraged them to find things that they found fascinating. If that was me, my dad would have been cool with what I was doing, but would have definitely like, don't take that apart. I just bought it. Whereas I was like, tear it, take it apart, open it up. Let me see. What are you doing? Show me what you're doing. I, I never, ever told him other than the normal discipline stuff you have to give a kid, but I rarely would tell him, stop, don't, you shouldn't do that. Because I, I hated that when I was growing up. And there was so many things that I lost interest in just because there was so many rules around whether or not I could do it. Yeah. I, I always kind of looked at DTP because the, kind of the main members were all either college educated or like in the middle of their college educations when the music took off. All of us went to school. Yeah. But I think two chains was the one that graduated and everyone else. Yeah. He uh, graduated from Alabama state, even though we all should have stayed in school. Cause most of us was like juniors. So it didn't make any sense. And it took us a couple of years to get the deal. I made no sense to leave. I mean, it, Things happen the way they're supposed to happen. I guess. All right. Well, we're, we're we've exceeded an hour, so I want to be respectful of your time. But I really appreciate you coming on here and having this reunion slash interview, if we're calling it that. Um, what are you, what are you working on now, music wise? I just started getting back into the music thing. I've started doing um, music again. Started enjoying it again. Ironically, full circle conversation. My son is very much like, you need to do some songs, do some music. You need to do some stuff. This whole thing for me, in terms of getting back to the music, came from 2 Chainz. So shout out to him. Um, but uh, I use Be- Beat Stars religiously. Plug for you. I love Beat Stars. Um, I've, some of my new favorite producers are from Beat Stars. Uh, well, I want to know who you like. Uh- on that oh, stars. uh a guy named phallic he spells it f-a-l-a-k shout out to him a guy named boger b-o-g-e-r yep. young swisher beats oh. i've used a few from him Ah, oh, geez uh now now i'm drawing a blank uh but i i, I use beat stars religiously I, I absolutely love it see i gotta just start sending you beats again because you know here goes the thing. My name didn't come up yeah. in that list <laughs> No, 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 no. Here's the thing. I have yet to to use a pain beat, but here goes the reason why. This, this is this is an honest, this is 100 percent the truth. Um, as you know, I'm really good friends with Arsonist from the Heatmakers. He and I are gonna do a project. Um, 
if I know a producer, what Beat Stars did for me that's going to help us when we get back to working, I used to put you in an unfair position because I have a wide scope of beats that I like. And I didn't always know what to say. I want this here. I want this there. What Beat Stars does is put every idea I can imagine in one place where I can kind of comb through and be like, oh, I want this type of beat, this type of beat. And it's made me more aware of like, okay, I know I'm going for this sound at this age. At, at the age I'm at now, I'm not going for shoot them up, bang, bang, kill everything moving, because that would sound ridiculous. So what I actually like about Beat Stars is that I have no idea if this is correct terminology, but there's a lot of producers who are doing hip hop that I feel is more age appropriate, you know, um, and I think that now I can go to you and be like, hey, Payne, I'm looking for about six in this thing. But while you're being respectful of my time, I want to have one rant that I never get to have anywhere because I don't do interviews. Um, and it's very much in this vein. Bridging the gap in hip hop. Um, I don't think a lot of old niggas do a good job of articulating what the actual quote unquote frustration is. So as a resident old nigga, I'm going to take this time to do that um, because you're the only person I talk this open to. I think the uh, the closer you are to the origin of something, the more invested you are in that origin. I'm not old enough to have known when hip hop first started. I'm not that old, but I was a kid as it began to kind of make this meteoric rise. Um, at that time, people didn't see hip hop as real music, right? It was just noise. It was a fad. It would pass. The mentality was you had to harmonize, sing. There had to be some form of instrumentation for it to actually be music. So you heard that for years. I, I never forget. I think it was Q-Tip who said, rap is not pop. If you call it that, then stop. You know, it, rap music is its own genre. Rapping is its own thing. Lyricism is its own thing. So I think one of the things that has become misconstrued is that when you hear an older artist lament the new sound, the fear is not that I'm getting lost in the sauce. It's that you want the art of emceeing to remain. I can just get on a beat and rap, not sing, not harmonize, not, not saying anything is wrong with those things, but that I can just, as an MC, go and rap and that still be a viable form of hip hop um, at its core. But I think a lot of older artists make the mistake of deciding that if it isn't that, then it shouldn't count. And I hate hearing that message because I also think that's ridiculous. Hip hop has always had subgenres, always had different interpolations of the music. So this idea that if it's done like this, it's less hip hop, I disagree with. But I also disagree with the idea of somebody aging out of their passion. Right? I don't think somebody should be held to the idea that you're out of a certain age now, this thing that you've built your whole life around, this thing that you've always done, you need to stop doing it. That's my rant. Yeah, and you know, you brought up a good point. Back when we were younger and we started either listening to hip hop, even just the fact that you listen to rap in certain places, you had to kind of fight your way through because of the perception, because of the stigma. But then if you made that type of music, you had to fight even more. Now it's like, oh, yeah, rap. You're, everyone's parent, of, you know, the newer generations, their parents grew up on rap. They love rap. The, you know, there's rap. no fight there, you know? And like back then it was, I had a fifth grade teacher. I just saw him actually, shout out to Mr. Waters. But he um, he's the one that gave me KRS-One and Public Enemy, you know? And like, granted, I shared it with my parents and they were with it, but like, you weren't just inundated with rap and hybrids of rap pop this and that now it's just like rap is mainstream there's rap is pop there's there's no getting around it back then when it wasn't we had to really fight for it so i think a lot of people from our generations have this 
maybe it's just subconscious, but we're like, damn, you guys got it easy. You don't have to fight for shit. Everyone loves you. They didn't, they didn't love the people that preceded us or they didn't, you know, we, we had to argue for the validity of the music that we loved and the art form that we loved and the culture that we loved because hip hop as a whole culturally was completely marginalized. And now it's like, well, we'll take the music, music's mainstream culture and we can we can take it or leave it unless it sells products for a, a shoe company so it, it is it is different um our experiences are fundamentally different but i absolutely agree with, with it. that was a very diplomatic rant if i may say so <laughs> i just feel that um i love rap man and i hate to see this ridiculous kind of war of rap when i think that in actuality what makes rap great is that there's space for everybody. It's only 50 years old. So this is the first time that anybody in rap has had to deal with someone being significantly older than them. When you and I were growing up, when we loved a rapper, he was seven, eight years older than us. We didn't view him as out of touch because he was relative to our age group. Now it's not uncommon for Nas to be putting out an album at 49 and there also being someone putting out an album at 19 that's the first time this has ever happened in the history of rap music because it's only been around 50 years. So that 19-year-old does not realize, I mean this respectfully, the conflict is that hip-hop now is the vehicle for pop culture, but I don't think anyone in hip-hop ever wanted it to follow pop culture rules where your dad can't rap because your dad isn't cool. The problem with making cool the standard is cool is trendy. Cool doesn't have any foundation. Cool has no investment. And that's why you're seeing them circle, cycle through rappers left and right. It isn't because the rappers aren't talented, but it's because what's the next in thing? I love seeing Nas out on the road. I love seeing Wu-Tang out on the road. I hope that there is a time where the audience does what they do in every other genre of music. In every other genre of music, a dad is taking his son to a KISS concert, right? They're, they're, he's he's put him on to KISS. He's putting him on to Motley Crue, right? He's put him on to Anita Baker. He's And it's becoming, it's a generational thing now, and they're all enjoying it. Rap now has become so part of a trend that you're, the idea is, oh, rap is for kids. You can be too old to rap. Well, you can be too old to rap as the kids are rapping. But I don't think there should ever be a time where you're saying that someone is aged out of music because you wouldn't dare tell Anita Baker, you're too old to sing. So stop singing. You're, eight, you're aged out of singing. Yeah, and that's a good point. And the fact that I'm, I might get some angry comments. But I personally feel like Noms is making some of the best music of his career now. Yes. Yes. But but think about it. I don't think you should get angry comments. You know, I work with Salam. You, I, I'm, I'm so motivated to do music because for the first time I get it. And I know that sounds crazy to say at my age, but I came in from battle rapping. So I, it took me years to even understand how to make a song. I, I'm coming in from the era where you were rapping where there wasn't even no beat. You just wrote a rap off a beat in your head. So it took me a really long time to even get good at song making. It seems crazy to think that someone is like, oh, I got it. And someone's like, too late. I think Nas is in a good headspace. Hit Boy has brought out the best in him. I hope he makes records till he's 60. I'm old, so I don't care that he's old, but I like listening to Destroy Lonely and Griselda. I like listening to Wu Tang and Glorilla. I, I thought that that was what was supposed to be what rap was. I love listening to Lotto. I love listening to Lotto's music as much as I listen to J. Cole. And my playlist would piss people off because it can go from Mob Deep to Glorilla to Megan to the Migos because I don't care if it's good, it's good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We love it. We love it. <laughs> that's amazing. I think that's a perspective that needs to be shared, especially from somebody who's been in it, not just somebody who's been watching it happen. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. And I feel like we need a part two at some point because I know you got more rants than you, and I know <laughs> I know all three of us. <laughs> didn't anybody pissed off? My intention wasn't to piss anybody off. I love oh, you've you mellowed out. 
<laughs> a lot. <laughs> All right, then we'll we'll do a follow up with a very mellow and and diplomatic ranting I twenty at some point. Yeah, okay. uh, I always try to rope people into to follow ups just as like verbal agreements because you know I have to be sneaky with this podcast. Um, but hey, th- Aaron, thank you for being on here, Aaron. That because I know you're yeah, in the middle of a lot. Thank you for having me with an Atlanta legend. This was so dope. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciated this. I love this pain. Keep going, brother. Appreciate you.